are a lot of things about the heart of David, and I am only going to give you an introduction. I literally could spend the rest of my life talking about the heart of David. You know, something very practical. Put this off in the side of your notes. So if you're taking notes, and no pressure, if you just absorb by, by listening, that is totally, totally fine. Um, just you do what you need to do. Um, let me find this. I have a separate set of notes. The life of David is something that I believe every believer should study. Okay? And I'm going to make it very easy for you. The life of David. Start in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Chapter 16. And you go all the way to the end of the book. You continue into 2 Samuel. You start at chapter 1. You go through verse 24 which is the whole book. And then you continue in 1 Kings chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 12. That is the first portion of the life of David. That's like life of David, unedited, uncut, no censorship, okay? The second segment of the life of David is actually in Chronicles. We would say 1 Chronicles or 1 Chronicles. Um, but in the Hebrew canon, it's actually at the very end, it's a summary of the whole Old Testament. That's why there's so many names there. You know, hey, I want to spiritualize this for you. I, I actually have this thing online, and if you're interested in joining in this, please do. I believe every believer should spend at least an hour in the Word every day. It is so practical. I've started a group on Facebook called Bible in 70 Days. You can literally look at the hashtag. It's there. Unfortunately, it doesn't trend. But help me make it trend. <laughs> you can read through the whole Bible in 70 days, and it only takes one hour. It's very practical. Find the Blue Letter Bible app on your, on your smart device. Download it. It's free. Go to the New King James Version. You just click on a few buttons. You have an audio Bible for free. And guess what? The beauty of it is you can listen and read along right there on your mobile device or read along on your hard copy. One hour a day. I've plotted it all out for you in the group. You can get through the scriptures five times in one year if you do this. And the New Testament an additional sixth time. I am now to my 13th time of reading through the whole Bible. I love it. I love the Word of God. Um, so, but yeah, little side note. So getting back into the notes. Okay, life of David can be continued in 1 Chronicles chapter 10 through verse 29. That's the life of David. So the heart of David. Heart. Okay, I want to just define this very easily for you. It's the most inward part. It, um, from a Hebraic perspective, it can actually be a place that you think from. You know, many times we think that we think with our minds. And yeah, you know, there, there is that time when you think with your mind. But, you know, especially when you're in the life of David, when you're in the heart of David, no pun intended, you know, with that. But, you know, when you're in the tabernacle of David, when you're studying about the key of David, you know, you, you got to learn to think with the inmost part, you know? Um, now, be cautioned. The scripture says that the heart is wicked and deceitful above all things, but when it's redeemed by the Lord, it becomes that wellspring of life, and we need to protect it, just like Proverbs says. Um, so the heart of David is what was at the core of David? What was at the core of David? There are so many leadership and character studies that we can do on David. Um, I actually thought about giving you a list of 10 attributes about David and go into his character, but the Holy Spirit was like, that's for another time. I want to get to the core of what was at the very core of David. What, what was David's heart? What was his inmost being? What, and I'm going to give it away by asking this question, what kept him up at night? Some of you might know the answer. Let's start looking through some scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. It's right there in your notes. 
This is Samuel. This is one of his first prophecies. He's literally just learned to hear the voice of the Lord. This is what Abba tells him. Then I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before my anointed forever. Believe it or not, this is actually about David. But wait, David's a king. He's not a priest. We'll learn a little bit more about that later. 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now your kingdom, this is, is, um, this is the prophet going to Saul, who is the king, but now your kingdom shall not continue. He's just sacrificed without waiting. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. A man after God's own heart. This is also about David. But David is also this adulterer. He's a murderer. He's a warmonger and a womanizer. He's still a man after God's own heart. Why? Because in the ways that God calls him to be obedient, he just simply is obedient. When God is like, David, you messed up, he runs into the presence of God without shame. And he's like, God, I don't want anything between me and you. And David even will try to start focusing in on his sin, but God will intervene many times, even in the struggle, and say, hey, David, just look at me. Just behold me. One thing I ask that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold your beauty in your tabernacle, you know, basically to see God, you know. This is the heart of David right here. 1 Samuel 16, 7. This is when the prophet has arrived to actually anoint David. This is a, a huge key in the heart of David, if you ask me. Um, but it says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. Literally, he has gone through all the sons of Jesse. David wasn't even invited. Rejection. They forgot to ask him to come. Because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. There's many, many, many lessons that we could unpack from these scriptures. Really, it boils down into this. Traits. He's faithful. He will do according to God's heart and mind. He'll be that faithful priest. He will walk before God's anointed Messiah forever. David understood principles that he shouldn't have in his timeline. He understood approaching God with no veil. You know, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next section. So in that 1 Samuel 2.35, we see that David is faithful. He does according to God's heart and mind, and he walks before God's anointed forever. 1 Samuel 13.14, we read it. He's after God's own heart. 1 Samuel 16.7, God looks at the heart. Don't you think that we should maybe be looking at the heart a little bit? So there's two more scriptures 
that we need to go into, 1 Chronicles 28, 2 and 9, it says, Then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made preparations to build it. As for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intents of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. 1 Chronicles 29, 9 and also 17 and 19. Then the people rejoiced for they had offered willingly because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord and King David also rejoiced greatly verse 17 I know also my God that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness as for me in the uprightness of my heart I have willingly offered all these things and now with joy I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you O Lord God of Abraham Isaac in Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you and give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision." Two more things. 1 Chronicles 29, 9, 17 and 19. Solomon's charge. I really believe Solomon's charge from his father David is a summary, if you will, of the heart of David. I'm just sort of kind of throwing these thoughts and ideas out there. Um, we'll bring these together throughout the rest of the night. Solomon's charge. A house of rest for the ark. That's the first thing. The second thing was to know God. The third thing was to serve him. It's right there in that scripture. The next thing was to have a loyal heart, to have a willing mind, and to actually seek God and to find him. Seek and keep on seeking. And then also 1 Chronicles 28, 9, or 28, 2 and 9. Basically, the desire, the heart of David was this. If I, if I would say it in one word, it, it was a man of one thing. And it was that God would have a resting place. One thing I have asked, this will I seek, that I may dwell in your house. You know, David was like, I'm going to give my eyes no rest until you have a house. He asks the prophet, the prophet is like, do what is in your heart. And then the prophet comes back to him and is like, well, wait, you've, you've been a warmonger. You cannot build a house, okay? And so there's a lot revolving around this, but really it boils down to this, a resting place, a resting place for Abba, for the father, a resting place for him and the ark of his might. Really, that's the heart of David, that there would be this manifestive presence, beauty, raging beauty, that would be before him for the rest of his days, and that he would be able to look at it with his own eyes. I really believe that's the heart of David. In a nutshell, that's the heart of David. There were a few things that the Lord gave me, you know, just prophetically as I was preparing this. And so I'm going to conclude this part by just saying this. These are some revelations that, that the Lord gave me, and they're very simple. But I, I just believe that this is for us. This is for our city. Heart of David revelation. It was really about the express will of God. If you tear apart the Hebrew phrase, fear of the Lord, it means a few things. It, it, first of all, it means to hear the audible voice of God. Okay, there are many places in the scriptures where people heard God's voice. The children of Israel, the first time that the fear of the Lord appears to them, it's on the mountain. God has come down. There's this storm. There's these lightnings, a fire, all of this noise. And they're like, we don't want to go talk to God. You go talk to him. <laughs> because they heard the trumpets. 
they were hearing God in the camp. And so really, the revelation of the heart of David is to have the fear of the Lord. It goes beyond just having this heart of worship or this heart of reverence. Yes, those things play into that concept. But are we really positioning ourselves as singers and musicians, as artists, as prayer leaders, as section leaders, as people who just sit in the presence of God? Are we being like David and we're like, God, what is your express will? When you're going on your outreach, you know, the prayer room is not your support. Your encounter with God is your support. You know, if you haven't encountered God for yourself, when you're getting ready to go on on your outreach, everything that we're doing in the prayer room means nothing because you aren't having that express will, really knowing exactly what God wants. Okay, and, and it's not this argument of like, do I need to stay in the prayer room or do I need to go out on the outreach? It's not that kind of an argument, okay? You need to make a vow before the Lord and keep it even if it hurts, okay? You need to make a commitment. And so you, you definitely, Stephen is a man of commitment, okay? So if you have a commitment, stay with it, you know? But do you have the fear of the Lord? Have you had the encounter yet? If you haven't, maybe you should take a few more minutes in the prayer room. You know, the whole reason why we do a prayer room, the whole reason why we even try to bring a Tabernacle of David type of thing to our city is because Jesus is worthy. It, it, that's just the bottom line. Jesus is worthy. Another thing, okay, the pillar, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud. It's very interesting, you know, and there, there's, a, there's probably a lot of reasons why this um, pillar is no longer evident. But I just really sensed the Lord saying that, you know, in a way, that pillar, that, that, that leading, that guiding, when you have the heart of David, God, it's almost like God moved the pillar that would almost tell David where to go into the heart regions, okay? And, and I don't really have much of a scripture to come at this from, but this was just something that I sensed from the Holy Spirit, is that really the direction of the manifest presence of God being taken from Obed-Edom into Jerusalem, about a five-mile, you know, distance or so, you know, there, there was something miraculous about that, and we're going to talk about that in the next section, but, you know, the other thing is this, and this one really just alarmed me. And Nate, I believe this is for you and other leaders. Um, um, you know, Mary, you also, you, you've really sown in the house of prayer. In all of the preparations that David did, he redirected his whole kingdom, okay? And he was like, we are going to be a kingdom that worships. In all of the preparation that he did, he didn't get to see the house. He didn't get to see what kept him up at night. You know, bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city of David wasn't enough for him. He's like, God, you, you just have this tent. And here I have this palace. He makes all these preparations and he doesn't even get to see it. You know, I'm not just talking to Nate and Mary and myself. And if I left anybody else, I, I'm sorry. You know, I didn't mean to do that. This isn't just for us, but do you know what? If we waste the rest of our lives trying to work toward 24-7, it's going to be so worth it because that was the heart of David. That is exactly what David did. And so let's just um, take a few minutes to just pray. Abba, um, we just come before you right now. We just lay our hearts bare before you, and we just um, we long for deeper revelation. We long for a deeper heart of worship, a deeper heart of praise, a deeper heart of encounter. Um, give us the heart of David in an increasing measure and in an increasing way. In the name of Yeshua.